terribly sorry to those of you I came and dragged out of the coffee shop down the back. Are you okay? Yes. And for those of you who are still in the room, you remember when I said I was going to go out and rustle up some people for our first speaker this morning? I know that they're out there somewhere. I started ringing my bell, and as I did, people were going like this. And I thought, well, just uh, maybe I'll speak quietly instead, and that will get them in here. So well done to all of you. You've done a great job. We certainly had a fantastic night last night. For those of you who live here in Bustleton, did you go home and just in, enjoy a bit of downtime in front of the TV thinking about what you saw? Yes? Yes, we envy you because many of us now have a three-hour journey in front of us to get back to sunny old Perth but we're very lucky with the weather over the last few days I know many of you were out making the most of it this morning with your walks I wasn't one of them because Stewie had me working Kind of typical isn't it he kept me down here to work I don't know and we're going to get to work straight away this morning we've got two sessions the first one's going to finish at around about 11 o'clock we have a fantastic morning tea planned for you as always at any point during these speeches this morning these presentations if you want to go out grab a coffee and bring it back in. I think you know the drill well enough now to know that is fine. Please don't wait to the end. If you need to go and get it and come back in, please do. No one will be offended. And then we have our next break and we're hoping to finish up by about one o'clock this afternoon. We've got a great presentation to finish off with and I would love to see you all here for that. So let's get underway. Stephen Morgan is first up on stage for day three of Southwest Connect. Now this uh, fellow here is from ESG Capital. He's actually the managing director and ESG Capital advises and guides corporates on ESG and sustainability with a big focus on generating financial, environmental and social value. They work with a wide range of clients from pre-IPO uh, mineral explorers right the way through to the ASX 100 corporations. Steve is here to unpack how those three little letters are shaping business and investment decisions and uh, who and what's behind it. Would you please make him welcome? Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, yeah, it's really good to be here. A quick thank you to Stewie and Jackson and um, the Canaccord crew for putting the event on and giving me the, giving me the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, uh, I'm actually um, a proud Bustleton boy. I did grow up, you know, grow up in Bustleton. Uh, and I must say, it's a little surreal because uh, the last time I was in this room was actually for my year 12 high school ball. Um, a, a bit over a bit over two decades ago. So I've had some I've had some flashbacks, but uh, got my my bearings. But um, here today to talk about ESG, uh, you know what it is, its impact on the corporate and investment landscape, uh, and where we see it heading. So it's it's nothing if not topical. Uh, it's full of um, a really divergent range of views. On one end of the spectrum, you've got large, uh, significant global investors doubling down on ESG. Um, you know, you've got regulators in global markets uh, acting to support the development of an ecosystem um, for, for those investors. And then at the other end, you've got this sort of anti-ESG movement, uh, which is mainly coming out of the US where ESG isn't the first thing to, to be politicised, and I'm sure it won't be the last, um, but also the, the outperformance of traditional energy stocks. So... You've sort of got these, these two ends and a, and a whole lot of uh, views in the middle. These are some of the headlines from the past 12 months. And, um, you know, we see ESG as a structural shift and in, 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 in some ways similar to, um, you know, what the internet did for businesses around. And we, we looked at some of the headlines in the early to mid 90s around the internet. And there was some that were, were on the lines of uh, the internet will, will go spectacularly supernova um, through to this internet thing will, will never catch on. Uh, so like any significant structural change, you know, some of those will age well and some of them won't. But I think to understand it, it's really valuable to know how it came to be. Um, it isn't a new thing. It's been around since mid-2000s. And around that time, there was a, a growing consensus in, uh, in global financial markets that uh, environmental, social and governance issues were um, playing a, a really impactful role in terms of companies' value and, and their ability to compete successfully. So the UN um, pulled together 20 financial, major financial institutions, and a number of those are on the screen there. Uh, and they were tasked with coming up with a plan to, to, to better integrate um, these factors into the assessment, um, you know, investment and, and asset management process. So... Yeah, the main point from this is that it was born as an evaluation tool for, for investors. Uh, 
and it's I suppose followed a natural evolution to become something that companies can use to evaluate themselves. Um, so what is it? Well, it's best characterized as a, a data driven framework that helps stakeholders understand how an organization is managing and performing uh, on the risks and opportunities uh, around ESG. Um, it's used interchangeably with the term sustainability. They're, they're similar but different. ESG is often thought of as a sort of an outside in uh, tool, whereas sustainability is more of an inside out um, concern with businesses' efforts to and, it's, and initiatives to, to manage the sustainability of their operations. And um, here's, a, I suppose, a, an unpacking of some of the examples of the, the topics that fall under the, the, the different pillars. Um, some of you may be thinking that you know, companies managing these risks is, is nothing new. And there's some truth to that. But um, what is new is that the, the presence of a, a structured globally accepted framework to assess them and, and strategize them and, and communicate them is. Um, materiality is a central principle. It's all about financial materiality. Companies don't need to, to worry about all of these, but it's which are, which are the ones that if they get them right or they get them wrong, are gonna have the greatest impact on the business. Uh, and the other misconception I think is that it's something that's exclusive to, to, to green businesses. And um, it's really not, it's not an accurate view. Um, it's a way of viewing any, any company or any investment and how it interacts with those topics on the screen. Um, so the, the, the drivers, well, investors were the first domino, um, very much a, uh, a long-term, uh, the, the, the long-term time horizons of pension funds and super funds have um, driven it. A lot of these issues compound over time. Um, global issues around climate change and biodiversity and the like. And, you know, some of them, some of some recent examples of not managing those well and the impact it has on companies. If you look at climate change, you know, AGL, I'm sure you've all followed the, the gyrations there recently. And if you go back five years, you know, their share was trading at $25 and it's now at six and there's been a whole range of issues um, with, with them. So clearly they haven't managed the, 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 the climate um, and energy transition well. Um, and then to pull another one out in terms of data privacy, you know, the Optus hack that happened recently, uh, it's projected to cost Optus between somewhere between one and, and two billion dollars. So um, it does have a, a pretty profound impact on, on values. Um, what does it look like in action? So as an investor, when you look at a company, how do you know that they're adopting it and integrating it? There's a few different proxies um, that are listed on the, the screen. They're sort of split into two. The top four are, are really uh, around disclosures and reporting and measurement. And the bottom one is, is uh, around the strategic integration. Um, yeah, greenwashing is a, is, a, is a topical subject. Uh, you know, that fourth, that fourth bullet point there, um, companies that set ESG targets without a supporting plan, that is the very diff definition of, of greenwashing. Um, and it's obviously a focus at the moment for some of the regulators. Just interestingly, we looked at the companies that were exhibiting here this week, and we found that 10% of them had a defined um, ESG strategy, um, and they range from 8 million market cap to about 288 million market cap. So um, there's not many that were doing it, that are doing it, um, but it's not something that's an ex exclusively for, for large businesses. And what does it look like for investors when it's in action? Well, there's a, there's a spectrum of ESG investing approaches from purely the integration, which is the, the consideration of it, uh, right through to impact investing. Um, they're all about delivering financial returns. Um, and as you head sort of towards your right on that table, uh, it becomes more about um, returns, you know, plus, plus impact. So um, integration is the most popular. It's about 80% of ESG investing uses an integration approach. And the main dis distinction is that compared to traditional investing, um, it's sort of an, an expansion of the, the risk lens. So this is a, an insight into how it's being adopted around the world. Um, this study was done early this year, uh, 1100 plus institutional and wholesale investors from uh, around the, the globe, not 19 countries and the total assets under management for the group that was surveyed was 32 trillion. And they were asked to select the option that best describes their approach. So whether it was 
considered uh, whether ESG was applied or whether it was central, uh, or if they just weren't convinced about it and didn't use it at all. Um, and as you can, you can sort of see, I'm try this, but across those three segments of that column, you know, there's 89% of those 1,100 plus investors use ESG in some way to, to make um, their investment decisions. And there's a breakdown of some of the other jurisdictions. So you sort of get the sense that, you know, whilst it varies a bit across jurisdictions, um, you know, the weight of the capital in this segment's committed. And then the second point that we often talk about with our clients is, you know, if you're a corporate, given these statistics, um, you know, is your approach to or, or lack of ESG um, enabling or disabling your ability to attract capital, particularly in a, in a, in a market where that's tightening a little bit? This is ESG investment growth. Um, the main take from this one is that around uh, 2024, uh, the, the balance shifts um, and ESG funds are, um, are, are projected to continue to grow, whereas non-ESG funds actually plat plateau and then, and then start to decline. And this is a really interesting one. This is, um, I suppose, proof that it's been tested uh, in, in the last few years. So uh, here you've, you've got COVID, of course, and these are the, the early um, sort of market gyrations of 2022. And what it shows that throughout these patches that ESG funds were resilient. Um, this, is, this is European data. Um, it's important to note that. Um, but uh, you can clearly see that there's a resilience and that speaks to the investors' com investors' confidence in, in ESGs um, as a, a long-term risk management tool um, and value creation tool, and something that supersedes short-term market volatility. And does it work? It's probably the the main question most of you have got. Well, the research is still building. Um, when, whenever we look at this, we we really like to look at a body of work and. Um, so this, this is from a, a meta study, um, a study of studies that looked exclusively at uh, companies that adopted ESG um, or climate change as part of their strategy uh, and whether they performed positively, neutrally or, or negatively financially. And you can see that those companies that adopted a holistic approach to ESG and integration, um, there was 58% of the studies showed a positive um, impact on financial returns, 34% uh, mixed, and then very few um, showed a negative correlation between um, ESG or climate action and returns. Uh, and this, this data is, is hot off the press only this week. Um, so it compares non-ESG funds with funds that have actually been certified for their ESG approach by the Responsible Investment Association of Australia. Um, there's a significant portion of Australian super funds that have been certified by um, that, that association. And so they compared the performance of, of their funds against Morningstar benchmark equivalents over one, three and one, three, five and 10 year time horizons. You can see the, the results are clear and it's really quite distinct, um, the outperformance as you look at those longer term time horizons. Um, and just some insights into what's, you know, what's really happening, some of the, the issues that are really um, impacting companies and, and investors. So climate is a real game changer. Uh, out of all of those topics, it's the one that has is, is really got the most teeth. It's, it's um, shifting corporate strategies significantly. It's defining investment strategies. Um, and it's also, uh, I suppose, new in a sense that investors are trying to understand and quantify climate risk and the impact it's going to have on, on, on their investments or potential investments. And so there's a push to mandatory, to mandatory climate disclosures uh, across those countries you see there. Um, but it isn't just a global thing. That quote from CCI was taken 12 months ago. Uh, and it's really interesting. In our work, we, we, we work with companies that are small privately owned businesses through to uh, ASX 100 corporations. And um, there's really impact across that entire that entri entire chain. Um, 
this is an interesting slide. Uh, so this is just shows you carbon intensity of the ASX 200 compared to other developed market indices. Um, so it's obviously incredibly high. So it's the metric tons of CO2 equivalent per million dollars in revenue. And in the ASX 200, it's uh, the best part of double of um, the, the next highest in the UK. Regulation is ramping up. I won't spend too long on this, just mindful of time, but in, the, in Europe, um, yeah, the, the disclosure of non-financial data is heading down the same path as financial data. Companies will need to do it um, and they will need to have that assured and the US as well, uh, moving towards mandatory climate disclosures. ASIC have said they're watching these developments closely, so we expect there's some regulatory uh, action in Australia in the next few years. Um, and just I'll just pick one of these, but I think um, Woolworths and, and the Endeavour Group split, for those who aren't aware, uh, Woolworths um, had Endeavour as a wholly owned subsidiary. Endeavour owned a whole bunch of pokies um, by virtue of their, their ownership of pubs and clubs along the East Coast. Um, Woolworths institutional investors um, didn't like that, uh, and there was a number of investors that were looking at Woolworths, um, but it didn't pass the, the, the screening test because of the exposure to gambling risk. Um, and so, you know, that the decision to, to, um, to split those was, was made um, and happy to talk through the other examples if you want to catch me afterwards. Uh, and then lastly, it's a ticket to the game and, and lots of battery minerals discussions over the last few days. Um, you know, the bottom line is it's not going to be enough just to have the commodities. You'll need to be able to prove and demonstrate you're producing them in a way that's sustainable. And just to, to finish off the so what, um, so it's a straight, it's not going to be a straight line, sorry, um, but I think uh, the direction is, is fairly clear um, from the, the data I've taken you through today. You know, the weight of the world's capital is really committed to this. Um, regulations incoming and increasing. For corporates choosing when to act may be a defining decision. And, you know, this is fundamentally, this is change for corporates. And, um, yeah, some will, some will find the opportunities and create value out of this um, and others won't. That's all. Thank you. Hold on. Stephen, not to take away from the fantastic 15 minutes you just spent demystifying ESG for us in, in our investment um, woes, um, did you come with a date to the ball that you had here? You did? Do you remember him, her, him, whoever? Yeah? Did, did you get a kiss at the end? Oh, okay. All right. Anything else you want to elaborate on that? Happy with the 15 minutes there. Beautiful. Okay, you've moved on. You've moved on to bigger things. Dr. Tom Duthie, can you come and join us, please, sir? Dr. Tom is the Executive Director of Neurotech uh, International. This is a really interesting story. I've been following this one, and uh, it's something that affects many, many Australian families. And I'm going to bet when you've listened, finished listening to this speech, you will know someone whom this could possibly be helpful to, and it could be helpful to your investment portfolio as well. So you could be getting a two for one. So as I said, this is Dr. Tom Duthie. He is the executive director and he's gonna present on the company's focused corporate strategy and the development of its lead biopharmaceutical drug therapy called NTI-164. So it's an exciting clinical trial portfolio has been developed for this drug to treat rare pediatric neurological disorders, including the groundbreaking clinical results I'm not sure if he's going to have the up-to-date details on that, but he's the chief. All right, so he'll be able to fill us in on what has been happening up to date. Would you please make him very welcome? Thank you. Thanks, Christine, and thanks, uh, Panacord, for um, sponsoring what is a really nice program and uh, appreciate your time and attendance. Thank you. So, yeah, standard disclaimer. So just as, a, as an overview, as uh, Christina mentioned, this is what we do. Um, sort of our focus, um, I guess, historically, those who have known the company, wasn't necessarily um, uh, and resolutely focused on pediatric neurological disorders, but that's certainly the way we're going now. And there's a number of reasons I hope I can convince you of as to why that's a, a meritorious endeavor. And uh, from a valuation perspective, I think it offers the most you know, return for investors over the long term. Uh, so we, we have a, a proprietary extract from a cannabis plant. I uh, would like to think that we are not a cannabis company. We have a drug platform that so happens to be derived from a cannabis variety. 
our focus is really to regulate ourselves with the most stringent regulators in the world. And that is the US Food and Drug Administration. That's the European Medicines Agency and that's the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So with that, there's a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of work, costs a bit more, but what you end up with is a regulated drug with medical claims that you can charge uh, a reasonable amount of dollars on because the, the cost effectiveness is high. And also for, um, for patients, it, it's, it's good to the extent that the medical claims are supported by clinical results. This is just a corporate and cap table and summary. Uh, I think our performance has been pretty admirable in light of the, uh, the rest of the sector and more broadly with uh, ASX uh, generally. What I would draw your eyes and attention to is the R&D investment and also the operating expenditure in the business is $1 million annually. So everything we do goes to R&D. In the sector, if you if you're an investor in the sector, you don't want that to be a reversal. You want to see the the expenditure go to the R and D. That's what matters most. People count for far less, I think, in this situation. It's all about the technology. These are the four core strategies that we've now implemented over um, or implementing um, since I joined approximately six weeks ago. So resolute focus on pediatric patients. More particularly, we are focused on rare neurological. Uh, disorders with what's called neuroinflammation. So these are disorders where there's an inflammatory effect in, in, the, in the brain and that manifests itself in certain disorders, which I'll come to. And we know if through you know, extensive third-party literature with respect to cannabinoids and cannabis generally, that um, they have a, a very well-known and very well-researched effect on infl inflammation, inflammatory processes, and also neuroprotection and neuroregulation. That is, the neuronal cells in the brain are, are nourished um, and they are um, protected from certain inflammatory processes. So the literature is great. That's why I joined. Uh, I have, a, uh, I have a, um, a background in the sector and I, I like to think that we go into these trials with a, a really good sporting chance of showing you know, a clinical effect. We also have what I think is a really nice barrier. We work with key pediatric professors of neurology as our partners for our NTI-164 formulation. They are not going to run um, trials on, on pediatric patients if you have an over-the-counter unproven and, and poorly manufactured drug product. So that's good. And we're focused on drug development. So these are our four sort of core strategies in detail. Pediatric patients overlooked by big pharma, rule of thumb, they don't tend to focus down there. Um, they tend to be unencumbered drug therapy markets. So what I mean by that is there's no standards of care, there's no approved treatments. That's fabulous when you want, want to run a clinical trial because you're going up against a placebo or nothing. You're not going up against a standard of care. So we have, the, um, we have um, patients here that are not enrolled in clinical trials and we have the ability to leverage levers at the FDA, EMA and so on for these trials. We focus on rare disorders because, as I said, the literature is brilliant uh, around the effects here. Um, and NTI-164, we ourselves have shown that, and we focus on these neurological disorders with a um, first-in-kind, or first-in-man, or first-in-child, in fact, um, product NTI-164 for autism spectrum disorder. We, I've mentioned the clinical focus. Um, I'll just go to the focus on drug development. So we are doing everything right by a drug regulator. We are manufacturing this properly. And that allows us and it confers on us premium pricing and reimbursement. You will not get reimbursement unless you have a proven medical claim, period. A commendable effort by the team. We've moved from a preclinical sort of stage into, you know, pro forma 2023, where we have multiple phase one, phase two clinical trials in rare pediatric disorders. I'll come to PANS or PANDAS PANS. I, I would guess 99% of people in this room would have never heard of that. It is a, a rare uh, neurological disorder in children. They basically go to bed and wake up with uh, uncontrolled tick movements and obsessive compulsive disorder, currently untreatable. We have a 10 patient study ready to go for uh, PANS PANDAS. That is, a, um, that is a, uh, an effect in children that is profound and, and moderately to severely ill children would be uh, our target recruitment sort of profile. We also uh, plan to initiate a phase one, two study in cerebral palsy and also I'll come to some results in autism spectrum disorder, but we have also submitted for approval to start a phase two slash three trial uh, in autistic um, children next year as well. So that's a, you know, in my experience and career, that is a very rapid transition from preclinical to, to clinical and the team's done a you know, fabulous job there. Uh, I wanted to just put this quote up as, because this is the, the treatment goal for anyone that uh, works with um, autistic children and it's basically about enabling the child so 
Current treatments restrict the child. There's a treatment uh, called risperidone. The role of that drug is to reduce or dampen the aggressiveness and irritability. It does nothing for the child's ability to interact with, to socialize with, and to be a more um, integrated person in society. We believe NTI 164 is an, an enabling therapy. That is, we are looking to improve all of these facets and that is the absolute treatment goal in ASD. And that's sort of where we're focused. This is ASD in a, in a, in a I guess, a summary sense. Uh, it's much more prevalent than most in the room would probably appreciate. So one in 44 children have some form of ASD. The children we're treating on our trial, they have what's called level two and level three autism. So that's um, uh, children that require substantial care to very substantial care and support. And as I mentioned at the start, we, we have a very strong rationale for um, treating these children. Um, ASC is, is a neuroinflammatory disorder. Uh, it is a chronic disorder. And so our treatment is not <clears throat> a once and done reverse autism and the children are fine. It's an intervention that will be chronically administered. And again, go back, going back to our strategy from a, a lifetime value perspective on a, a per patient, um, that makes it a, a very likable and, and high quality drug profile because the children will need to take this intervention uh, for a long time. If they, if they don't take it, then the symptoms will very much reverse. This was a trial. I, I won't sort of bore you with this or more, more sort of detailed um, sort of designations here, but basically 14 children. It was a safety study over 28 days. Uh, interestingly, uh, which gives us some confidence as we continue to treat these children, all 14 children were strongly recommended by the, uh, the clinician, Professor Michael Fay, and also their parents to continue treatment. So we had envisaged uh, titrating these patients down after 28 days, but as it turns out, all patients continue treatment. And for us, uh, albeit we don't sort of see how quickly the autism returns, what, what we do do is collect a ton of data and the data we reported in July of 2022 was at 28 days. Uh, we are imminently um, going to report the 20 week data in these children. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is that the fact that 93% of these patients showed a, an improvement in their clinical symptoms. And that's as measured by the clinician, not the patient or the, the caregiver. And the severity of illness score, I wanted to sort of just call this one out particularly because the chart I think on the right uh, may look complex, but it's a pretty, easy to understand uh, goal for us of what we need to do. So seven is the most critically ill child. One is normal. And the orange curve, that's the normal distribution, but the orange blocks here represents the children at baseline. So day zero. And at day 28, we've shifted these markedly to severely ill children to what would be classified clinically as a, um, as a mildly ill child. And that's after 28 days. So you know, neuroinflammation typically if you're trying to dampen neuroinflammation, the longer you can intervene in inf inflammatory processes, so be it, the patient should get better. So what you should look out for with our 20-week data is you, you want to see this, shift, uh, this curve sorry, shift a little more to the left. Having said that, uh, from a clinical perspective, that is an extraordinary shift right there at 28 days. And a clinician looking at that would, would look at um, uh, the profile and go that is clinically meaningful so what does that mean that in medical parlance means i would prescribe it and that's important um, just going to our pro forma pipeline again what we've tried to do very quickly here is to add depth and breadth so we're not a one-trick pony to the extent that we have uh, three other um, pediatric disorders that we're looking at so cerebral palsy pandas pans obviously including asd our milestone, we have a rich vein, to use a, a resources parlance, uh, of uh, news flow that we, we expect to have this quarter and also progressively throughout 2023. So these are related to regulatory approvals to commence our trial, regular, um, completing recruitment of these trials and reporting uh, data from these trials. In the very near term, as I mentioned, uh, keep your eye out for the 20-week data in these children. Um, but I'm, I'm very excited and, and very pleased that we've been able to so quickly take this manufactured drug product and put it into um, very sick children. Uh, this is a summary of our strategy. And what I've done here is try to map out um, what we're doing and try to trying to compare and contrast that to what others have done. I'm unashamedly a fan of um, two companies. One's Neuron Pharmaceuticals in Australia. I followed that for 15 years. 
and GW Pharmaceuticals uh, because they as well, like us, they have a, an extract or a highly purified extract of something called CBD. And that's derived from a cannabis plant. That was the first regulatory approved drug in the field. And the way that they, these companies have created extraordinary value for shareholders is just be really focused. So they both started off, funnily enough, looking in adult disorders. So GW was looking at, uh, I think, MS and pain. So by total addressable market, 20 billion bucks, brilliant. Well, what's your market share? Mm, 0.1 maybe if you're lucky and you get through the regulatory hurdles. So what they did is they, they stratified an epilepsy market. So epilepsy is a, is a, is a non-orphan or non-rare disorder of children as well and adults. And they found two sub, um, what, you, what we would call sub indications called Dravet and Lennox Gastel. They, they levered those with those regulatory tools I've mentioned. Uh, they got approval and then they're required. And similarly, neurin is, much, is, is very much on the same pathway. And so for us, we have these indications sitting here that we're currently treating, but we have you know, greater potential to look at all these other indications as well, because guess what? The literature supports that there's a strong neuroinflammatory effect in each of these disorders. We treat neuroinflammatory disease, bang, there's your next study. So our outlook, uh, we are focused on rare pediatric neurological disorders. We've shown now that NTI-164 is safe and efficacious at 28 days. Our 20 week data is imminent. We have these accelerated clinical development tools via those deep uh, clinical relationships with professors of neurology, both uh, in Monash at, in Melbourne and also at Westmead in, in Sydney. We were driving hard to recruit and treat these patients. It's very likely if, if the treatment continues to show an effect that the, we, will provide, well, we will provide the treatment ongoing for these children. So we will continue to report lots of data over the longer term. So for example, PANS PANDAS is just looking at uh, um, 10 children over eight weeks. Uh, if it works, those children will continue to receive the intervention. We have that really good clinical engagement. So I think that is one of the best barriers we have in Australia. I'm sure most of you in the room are highly familiar with tons and tons of over-the-counter cannabis formulations in oil, sprays, tablets. None of them have any uh, ability to uh, claim a medical indication. So what's happened in the last few weeks is the Therapeutic Goods Administration has fined three companies a million dollars for basically promoting uh, their, ex well, their extract, their formulation as treating a medical disorder. You can't do that unless you've got clinical evidence. So the way we do it is to get the clinical evidence by basically manufacturing a product that is fit for purpose from a regulatory perspective. And we deeply and thoroughly engage with the clinicians and their ethics committees at the hospitals. So we love that. So we're, it, you, it would be very unusual, I think, from here to see other cannabis companies coming in and working with these same professors in much the same indications. And we have lots of levers at the uh, Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency. So I will wrap it up and leave it there. And thank you for your attention. Please stop by if you want to have a chat later. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely fascinating. The implications that it could have are fantastic. Really, I really enjoyed that presentation. Right. Now your program in front of you would have had the fact that the lovely Angus was about to present for us about Forestania this morning. Andrew Angus is uh, unavailable. In his place, we have the absolutely fantastic Mr. John Hannaford. Now, John will be well known to many of you. He is a, an experienced corporate executive, extensive experience in the ASX resources uh, sector as a corporate uh, executive, uh, an advisor, also a chairman. He is a founding shareholder of Forestania and he's helped to lead the company through its IPO process last year. He's been involved with a number of junior explorers. He's very well versed with junior exploration companies. Let's have a listen to him this morning and his take on what could be a big investment opportunity for us. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. I'm not sure how much of all that uh, is true, but very glowing uh, words. Thank you very much. And um, welcome everybody. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to present Forestania uh, resources and, and the upcoming drilling programs. Also I'd like to congratulate uh, the, all of the people putting this conference together. I think it's a great initiative and I think it can only grow uh, as the years go by. So thank you everyone for coming and supporting and we look forward to seeing you over the years. Uh, there's a usual disclaimer. So here's a, a, an overview of, of Forestania. Um, the company listed a year ago, uh, just over a year ago, and mainly around um, some key uh, 
key projects, the, the, the principal one is the Forestania project that we acquired as part of our IPO. Um, the key thing I think likely to, um, to, to take away is we've got um, significant land holdings in tier one WA resources uh, precincts. Um, so that means we have this existing mineralization of significant endowment. We have significant existing major players in all of the areas. We have significant um, infrastructure services and, and those sorts of things. So we, we, we're not spread all over the world. We, we, we are in areas where they are, there's major mines have been found and we hope that will be continue to be found. Um, we've got a strong pop pipeline of, of lithium and gold prospects, um, which we'll get to. Uh, we, we've had a, a fairly active program since, uh, since listing. Um, a lot of that has been about around getting approvals, getting a, a feet on the ground, getting into the data and preparing for the drilling programs. And as I'll get to, we're just about to, to start off our first lithium drilling program. Um, predominantly, uh, our focus at the moment is in the Forestania project um, for, for lithium uh, and gold. But further, other projects are more, more focused on gold and they're a little bit further um, down the track in terms of their state of advancement. Um, and, but uh, we'll get into the Forestania project, which uh, we think has the potential to unlock some significant lithium discoveries and also gold. So we've got a, a motivated and experienced team on both gold and lithium, which we'll get to, and high, highly leveraged to exploration success. Here's a bit of a snapshot from a corporate perspective. Um, we're, uh, we're just in the process of completing a, a two tranche share placement at the moment. So the shares on issue after that will be completed is, is 69 million, which we think in this market is very, uh, very modest and very tight. Um, and we'll have a low market cap and we'll be cashed up to um, deliver on these programs. So obviously we know that the, the, the lithium um, thematics at the moment, uh, there's a lot of big numbers being bandied around. With this market cap, we think any discovery is going to have a significant influence on that for us uh, and then give the support in the market to be able to push on and develop something. So a great opportunity um, up until now, we haven't been able to say when we will be drilling. I'm pleased to say today we announced that we are starting our drilling campaign uh, in Forestania with the drill, the drill rig about to start drilling its first hole. So it's exciting times for us uh, and exciting times for investors. Uh, the team, um, when we started, that was really uh, uh, a, a team um, around the founders and, and gold-based um, exploration team. Um, and I'll just, David and myself um, on the corporate side, Billy Higgins is one of our founders. He uh, is, a, is a gold geologist, um, currently working as the exploration manager at Capricorn uh, Metals, um, has a significant both Billy and, and Ashley uh, Bennett uh, worked together um, at Northern Star where they found significant um, granite hosted gold discoveries. And we'll get to that. That's the uh, part of our gold um, exploration strategy. Angus Thompson, the CEO, he's a geologist. He's the reason I'm here is he's up on site with the drill rig. So um, unfortunately couldn't be here, but um, exciting times and has to be, be on deck there. Um, and Mel McClelland, um, been a fantastic uh, addition to our team as I'll get to some really um, pertinent experience having worked for several years with Kidman Resources when they developed or discovered and, and drilled out the Mount Holland lithium project, which is right next to our major um, lithium exploration targets. So a really experienced team um, and uh, we're looking forward to getting to uh, some results. So just onto the Forest a project, I'll spend a bit of time on this because it is something to take away in terms of our ground position in a, in a tier one district. So this is the Forest Anya, um, uh belt. I'll come around a little bit here. Is that we're, we're surrounded by majors and we have dominant other majors. Across from the north here, the blue, that's the Prevail uh, Museum, which is Um, so when we acquired the project, we acquired all the ground in 
So orange and pixel is the radius and they pass around to the cell of that station. So we we rely on again that that nature of distinction. Curve the sound in the in purple, that's the blue from the area um, project. Significantly um there is our nickel focus. Um they have all the green stone metal to the south. Our projects are both sides of that. Um, however, um, what is significant there is that um, they are not focused on city, they do have liquid on the ground, which is get to. Um, but the big part of the ocean that's happening with the different areas, this has become a much more active metropolitan um, area. So we have what's called the Goldilocks corridor, which is just off the, 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 the um, greenstone contact. We have a 100 kilometre strike along that contact. That, that is significant. We believe we have one of the best exploration and uh, nickel exploration permanent packages in Australia. Now, obviously, we've got to prove that that's that correct by, by making it a little bit uh, higher for um, more prospect. So, that's, I think, one thing I'd like to take away here is that um, we've got the only other major major holding in this belt. Um, there are some, there's obviously very, very highly mineralized with nickel, with gold, and with lithium. Uh, and we think there's a significant opportunity to undercover more major um, major deposits. Uh, and as I said, we're we're drilling. Um, we, we announced today that the the uh, drill rig is on site and starting to drill the first prospect, which is in the north here, which we call Bounty East, which I'll get to. The main areas for us are in the north, Bounty and Gem prospects, and then also in the south, down south, Iron Cap, Bannon. Um, and there's, there's a major lithium system, we think, developing down here. So I'll run through our major lithium um, prospects that we're, we're looking to drill. Um, and given the time, I think we'll, we'll just focus on them and then we'll, we can come back to the, the gold a bit later on. Just a, a bit of a pipeline of prospects. Obviously, it's a big area. There's, there's big areas. There's lots of prospectivity. and We've got a lot of work to do, but this just gives you an idea where we are at the moment. We drill. Oops, hang on. Back. Wrong button. This, um, this, these are the, the four um, lithium prospects that most advanced that we will be looking to drill uh, starting uh, this weekend and then further into later this year um, to try and test four, four major prospects. On the gold side, there, there are some, some major prospects there as well. We, we're not aiming to drill them just at this minute, but they do present a fantastic opportunity for shareholders when, when gold starts to finally come out of its slumber. So this this is um just again uh, to illustrate the the, the uh, proximity to the the Earl Grey deposit. Um, Earl Grey is is this this prospect here. You can see the built in airstrip and there's tailings dams and so forth. Um, that was discovered uh, when they um, found pegmatites in the in the gold uh, in the Bounty gold mine, um, and and Kidman acquired all this ground as part of an acquisition of of Bounty. Um, mainly looking at gold. They then discovered lithium and became very fixated on, on the prospectivity of lithium there. Um, what we're looking at is what we're calling Bounty East, just, just over here. Um, and this prospect, um, significant, I suppose, in what they didn't find in the previous drilling. Um, these pegmatites uh, and, and our, our expert advisors have been telling us it's all about the pathfinder anomalism um, and the pathfinder elements you're seeing here tantalum, beryllium, cesium, and rubidium, very sort of lesser known, but in in uh, uh, in these LCT um, pegmatites, they're quite significant. Because if you can find the, the, the pathfinders, then you're onto the lithium at some point. Um, what Mount Holland found here, well, Kidman, when they're drilling Mount Holland, is that the lithium that's in the, the, the shallower zone, what we call the weathered section, had all been leached out. It's just a, a fact of nature. Um, so they were finding no lithium, but they had pathfinder elements in the system. All their lithium starts at about 60 plus meters deep. Uh, so what we're looking at here with, with our Bounty East prospect is to deal, drill deeper than, than the previous uh, explorers ha had done. Now they had drilled some shallow holes here. They found all the pathfinder elements. They found pegmatites. They didn't, uh, uh, and it's you know different times, a different different uh, corporate strategy perhaps, but they they uh, decided to walk away. Um, and our uh, lithium exploration team, headed by Mel, who was part of this exploration team, she said, "Well, this is where that lithium potentially is." 
So it's a fantastic opportunity for us to prove this theory. We're out there drilling this starting this weekend. Um, and obviously if we are able to find anything of the similar to Mount Holland in terms of the scale of the pegmatite system, then we're onto something quite significant. So this to, to me is, is a, it's, we finally after nine months been able to announce that we're, we're going to be drilling this. That's so a magnificent time for us. Uh, and the, the fingers are definitely crossed, toes are crossed, but um, a great opportunity for us to find something else of scale. The second prospect we're, we're, we're looking to drill um, is, is the, the, the gem cutter and gem mine. Uh, this is a little bit further south. You can see on here that we're just a bit further south from Mount Holland. Um, now the previous um, owners of the, this pack, tenement package, they drilled a fantastic hole, 34 metres at 3% uh, lithium uh, several years ago. And that's up in this part of the tenement. Um, and this, I think, is a good illustration of this weathering that happens to lithium and these pegmatites. That is the early stage. That is pegmatite, but there's no lithium. Uh, and the deeper section of the hole where they found the 34 metres at 3%, as you can see, it's quite a different type of um, mineralization. That uh, in, is, is indicative of what's happening across the belt with these, these, um, uh, this weathering. We, we have approval to drill a, a prospect down here. We call the, the GEM prospect. I know I'm running out of time here. Um, and that's what we're, we'll be drilling as the second prospect um, to try to um, indicate, uh, a, 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 again, a deeper opportunity uh, or deeper extension of those pegmatites. Um, I'll touch also on uh, our southern prospects. There's two main prospects, Bannon and South Iron Cap. The Bannon prospect is right next to uh, the western areas ground here. Um, it has been drilled. There are significant pegmatites, but without that the high grade lithium, we're going to retest that uh, that prospect as well. And the other major prospect, which we we are hoping to get approval by the end of the year to drill, is the South, uh, South Iron Cap East. And significantly here on the western areas tenements, where I said they had not been focused on lithium, they have a 50 meter intercept at one percent lithium here. And one k away, we're finding outcropping pegmatites that have never been drilled. So a significant opportunity. Obviously, if we find something here, it opens up a whole new lithium exploration field in the south. Um, and we're hoping to get approval later in the year to drill that one. So um, I'll just come through the, with the gold. Um, any, anyone keen on the gold, come down and see me at the booth. We, we're quite excited about it, but the um, market's not really giving us much for it. Um, uh, again, through the gold. So the work program and highlights, we've got several projects we're drilling later, uh, starting uh, this weekend and later this year. And then we'll have a lot more uh, regular drilling and, and workflow. There's a lot of environmental and heritage work going on, which has continued. That gives us next year's um, drilling targets and, and exploration programs. The overview, as I said, unlocking an emerging lithium belt um, we've got a strong pipeline lithium and gold focus but we are in a major system major area and we've got a major um, tenement package so I think if you hold on uh, and you can, you can jump on board um, Forestani it's going to be a very exciting ride so thank you very much and look forward to um, maybe having a chat at the booth later Good on you, John. Well done. I think everything they said in that little bit was true, even if it was sent through by yourself earlier yesterday. No, not really. <laughs> We're going to change gear again. Before we do that, though, I just wanted to have a bigger shout out to everyone who is watching online at the moment. We've got about 240 people watching online. Great to have your company. A reminder that if you can't do as John has just offered to everyone, come and have a chat to him afterwards so he can flesh out the details. The contact details are on everyone's presentation or on their website, and they're more than happy for you to ring them personally. Hello. Now, this is going to be an interesting discussion. I'm going to do you. How old are you exactly? Early 40s. Early 30s. Oh, so some 42. of us are on the other side of 50. <laughs> and we keep getting these. I don't know about you, but I keep getting on my um, Facebook things, things about um, silver splitters and, um, you know, things of that help. You know, I do dye my hair. Uh, and it was interesting because they're all talking now about this thing called MDMA inspired therapies for people with, um, you know, getting through marital issues when you're in your silver splitter years. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. How do they do that? And when I read the intro for this bio today, I went, well, here might be one of the ways that they can make this an ethical trial rather than going to a corner shop and trying to do it themselves. <laughs> There's some really interesting information. 
outcome because you have made your life if nothing else and you you'll remember this fellow here it's going to be an interesting talk so let me introduce dr michael winlow he is the ceo and managing director of Ameria Limited. Now they are a clinical stage biotech, so clinical stage, and they're developing treatments for mental health, neurological conditions. They've developed a range of proprietary cannabinoid-based pharmaceuticals and leading an MDMA-inspired drug discovery program. So importantly, they're also managing a network of specialist medical clinics, and that provides them with real-world data that supports their drug initiatives. So to tell us more, would you please welcome Dr. Michael Winlay. Thank you, Chrissy, and good morning. And thank you so much for uh, coming here in person and joining online. Uh, I've been really looking forward to telling you the story of Amiria and uh, why I'm so excited about our prospects in developing new treatments for neuroscience uh, and mental health. But let's first start with a story. This poor chap suffers from Parkinson's disease. Uh, 7 million people are affected globally, making it the second most common neurological disorder after Alzheimer's disease. It's characterized by a depletion of dopamine, which is an important brain neurotransmitter, and untreated leads to this slow uh, movement, trouble starting movements, obviously difficulties uh, with one's uh, activities of daily life. You may know somebody personally with this disease, uh, and if not, you probably have certainly heard of Muhammad Ali or Michael J. Fox, two famous people who suffer from this condition. Fortunately, there is a treatment for Parkinson's disease. It's L-DOPA. In fact, its discovery was so remarkable, they made a Hollywood film about it, starring Robin Williams uh, and Robert De Niro called The Awakenings. Uh, this treatment gets your movement back, but uh, over a period of time, it itself can lead to a movement disorder. And you can spend uh, a lot of your time with those kinds of wriggles and, uh, and movement uh, challenges as well. And so this gentleman who you saw in the previous video, he's also uh, shown here, his name's Tim Lawrence. He's a stuntman uh, based in the UK who made a pretty remarkable discovery uh, one night. On the left here is, uh, is day one. This is what he normally would look like untreated. So he hasn't started his l treatment yet. And you can see he has great difficulty reaching for that cup uh, and, uh, and taking a drink. A little bit later, here you'll see his L-DOPA has now kicked in. So his movement has certainly improved, but he's got those uh, discoordinated uh, jerky movements, uh, which is a byproduct, a side effect of that treatment. Now on the right, you might be wondering what's going on. He looks completely normal. Uh, and on day two, he's taken uh, another dose of MDMA or ecstasy. And he actually discovered that this was uh, almost cured his condition uh, after a night out uh, at a nightclub. Now, the trouble is the reason that Tim doesn't take this drug every day is because it makes him high. He doesn't want to be out of his mind, uh, even though it might be improving his movement. And so that led to a journey of inspiration and discovery uh, at the University of Western Australia. And I'd love to, tell you, tell you through, to take you through that story. But first, what is MDMA? You probably have heard of it as ecstasy or the party drug. Uh, it is currently an illegal amphetamine. Uh, and I do want to stress that uh, the uh, MDMA that we're talking about is medically developed. It's ultra pure. The stuff that you get on the street uh, is, is notorious for being not what's advertised. And so I do not advise anybody uh, to go to their dealer uh, to treat your Parkinson's disease. Uh, stick with the medicine and, uh, and, and give us some time to come up with, with a treatment for you. But MDMA is really fascinating. It releases uh, three primary uh, neurotransmitters. Serotonin, you might have heard of, related to feelings of... Uh, well-being uh, and lifting mood, dopamine, uh, which is the cause, the depleted cause creates that Parkinson's uh, symptoms, and it's related to feelings of pleasure and satisfaction, and noradrenaline, and noradrenaline which is related to attention uh, and fight or flight. And so when you combine these three neurotransmitters together, you get these great effects, increased alertness, positive mood, and very strong pro-social effects. But of course, you get that persistent euphoria too. So the smart guys at UWA thought, well, what if we could take MDMA as inspiration, this structure here, make some modifications uh, and see whether we can remove the euphoria and actually uh, re uh, re keep, retain the positive sort of dopamine effects uh, that led to those positive symptoms that you saw uh, from Tim's video. And through a series of really innovative experiments, they're able to develop uh, a compound called UWA121 took it through a gold standard 
primate studies, and we're able to more than double the improved symptoms uh, without the hallucinogenic or the psychoactive effects of MDMA, a, a really remarkable uh, discovery. But there the project stalled uh, for many years, unable to get funding uh, until uh, Amiria teamed up with this group uh, a year ago. And that's begun a, a terrific journey of discovery inspired by this remarkable compound, MDMA. So why do we love MDMA so much? Um, well, mainly for its chemical properties. Uh, it is a small and stable molecule that gets into the brain, which is often something that's quite challenging to do for new drugs. We know that it uh, has many points of diversification. So we have the opportunity to make lots of different kinds of changes to that molecule and get, and get different effects. We also know that it's already active on important brain targets and we can tune the selectivity to uh, create therapies for a range of neurological uh, conditions. And so here are our opportunities and where we're focused. Adjusting this molecule to create shorter treatments, we can avoid some of the toxic metabolites and we can try and tune selectivity to remove the high from MDMA and make it uh, an important medication for conditions like Parkinson's uh, and also other major mental health disorders. So our program looks like this. We're starting with MDMA. We're creating new analogs uh, based on its structure. To date, we've created more than 140 novel analogs. We've actually synthesized, created and screened these compounds. We think it's the largest uh, library of its kind in the world. We're now taking it through a series of uh, important preclinical screens and creating uh, lead programs in a number of important uh, indications. But we're also interested just in the uh, euphoric properties uh, and pro-social effects of MDMA as well. And one of the more interesting areas where it's being studied today in depth uh, as, is as an adjunct to psychotherapy for major mental health disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder. The qualities that give this drug uh, a great uh, reputation as a party drug, increased feelings of well-being, sociability, decreased feelings of fear uh, and defensiveness also make it a great adjunct in therapy and can uh, make therapeutic uh, psychotherapy more durable uh, and effective. And in a really profound study concluded last year, a phase three study working with uh, patients suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, they're able to show that just up to three intensive sessions with MDMA alongside psychotherapy, that more than two thirds of the patients no longer met the di diagnostic criteria for PTSD. These patients were effectively cured from their PTSD. And each of these patients had an average of 14 years of treatment resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. So these kinds of studies alone are creating tremendous interest, uh, not only from the clinical community, but also from the investment world into the potential of compounds like MDMA. And we feel we have a really great lead on, on, on this program. Our MDMA program is also one of the primary reasons that we, we took uh, support from Andrew Forrest's private health fund. Uh, the 10 mile fund launched early this year uh, and we uh, are one of their first portfolio companies uh, as well. But that's not even the most perhaps promising or, or uh, immediate way that we are gonna return value for shareholders. For the last three years, we've, we've been working on an advanced cannabinoid delivery platform using ultra pure CBD uh, in a solid capsule form. And so what we're aspiring to be is the story of GW Pharma who spent 20 years, $2 billion perfecting the refinement, of their plant-based CBD so that it could be evaluated as a small molecule at the FDA. That's a really important uh, distinction. And eventually this company, as you've heard maybe a couple of times, was purchased by Jazz Pharmaceuticals for $7.2 billion uh, last year. And so the key takeaways from their story, their successful story, is that drug registration can create tremendous value, but you need really pure product and you need great evidence behind your indication. And so we've developed uh, a fantastic product. Rather than an oil or a gel cap or a dropper, we know our patients prefer solid oral dose forms. And so we've created a solid capsule that can improve the delivery of CBD, ultra pure CBD with no impurities uh, in the bloodstream. We know that it can deliver higher dose values in the hours three to eight, where you want your treatment to be working more, most effectively. And in a head-to-head -head comparison with Epidiolex, we showed a number of other distinct advantages. We've also got really great evidence and what gives us such strong convictions that we've got 
a good read on where cannabis works most effectively is because for the last three years, we've been managing our own network of medical clinics, which have been intensely focused on gathering important clinical evidence on where cannabinoids work most effectively. And that data helps us answer what dose forms patients prefer, what indications cannabinoids work most effectively in, and uh, what doses are most effective. And so that data is supporting uh, a really aggressive global registration program. We're starting first with over-the-counter opportunity here in Australia for the symptoms of psychological distress. But because our dose form meets the FDA purity standards, we, may, we use a lab-created CBD, not a plant grown. So we have full reassurances on its purity. We can take that dose form to FDA uh, and Europe as well. And so we can expand our geographic reach. And through our data and our ongoing clinical trial programs, we can also add additional indications and dramatically grow the commercial value of that program. We've also continued the innovation on the cannabinoid front and have a really remarkable product, RX7, which we're targeting from a range of prescription indications. Uh, and in a preclinical model, we showed that we could get four times the bioavailability of Epidalix. So we're really excited about that as well. We're starting to attract the interest from some major uh, global players as well in partnering with us, taking these drugs forward. So key investment highlights. First of all, that ultra pure CBD tech uh, with the purity to take it to FDA and beyond. We're in phase three clinical studies already for RX5. RX7 is coming up behind. We've got great real world data that continues to grow through our clinical service. And now we've filled a remarkable R&D pipeline with the MDMA inspired drug discovery work we're doing with UWA. And we've also got a world-class team to get us across the line. A couple of highlights here. Uh, Professor Sir John Took in the middle at the top, knighted for services to medicine, an expert in learning health systems. He's been a great advisor on how we set up our clinics so we can get the most with our patients. And Dr. Karen Smith up in the top right, you've heard the name Jazz Pharmaceuticals mentioned a few times. Karen was the ex-chief medical officer and global head of R&D at Jazz uh, and has been on multiple boards with uh, major uh, billion dollar acquisitions and some other folks here with experience in capital markets, clinical medicine, and in my own case, uh, data analysis and uh, clinical trials. The register is quite tight. Like I said, got the great support from the Forrest family there, earned 7.3%, tightly held register, and most importantly, uh, a tremendous program of work to look forward to over the next 12 months. Uh, on our phase uh, RX5, we've got the phase three study, which will conclude that allow us to register that treatment as an over-the-counter at TGA and then beyond. We've got the RX7 program entering into phase one early next year and pursuing a number of uh, prescription indications. And on the MDMA program, multiple preclinical activities that will read out and help us choose the most promising leads for commercialization. So I hope you follow our story. Uh, it's just getting started and I uh, look forward to hey, taking your questions out in the front. Thank you. Thanks. Very interesting, isn't it? I was thinking all those things that kept popping up, popping up in my feeds, where you're talking a little bit, slightly a little bit of a rubbish. But when you see it and you see the possibilities, it could be a lot of money made out of this. Because I know I would like to kill my husband every second day, and if I could have something like that, and it would get rid of fear and anger. No, that was being very, very. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Though. <laughs> So we are going to change gear again, and we're going to go into the world of battery metals. And this next one is an interesting Chemex. Uh, David Lever, would you like to come and join us, please, sir? He's the managing director. So Chemex is an advanced materials technology company, and they're focused on providing critical materials required for the electrification and decarbonisation of the global economy. And the company is involved in several projects. I'm going to let David tell you all about each and every single one of them and maximise his 15 minutes. Would you please make him welcome, everyone? Uh, thanks, Chrissy, And uh, also thanks to the RIU team for putting on such a, a great conference. Um, and welcome to uh, the presentation on Chemex Materials. Um, the standard forward-looking statement, which you can read at your leisure. Or you can read it now. Oops. We'll go back to uh, where we should be. Yep, so we're there.
Right. We'll get it right in a minute. Um, so we'll just start from here. Chemex Materials is a materials technology company um, focused on using the best of, of both mining and chemistry to deliver the critical materials needed for the uh, energy transition and decarbonisation markets. We've currently got three projects in the portfolio, um, high purity alumina, the Jamison Tank Manganese Sulfate Project, and the Kimber Kalen Rare Earth Project. But before we get into the details on those, just a, a quick word on sustainability. Sustainability is at, at the heart of what we do. The markets that we're selling into, the electrification, decarbonisation, uh, is really the, the heart of, of the market that we're selling into. And the buyers in that market demand that we take care of, of the environment and uh, the communities we're operating in right from the start. So we're at the enviable position of starting our project development um, and we're able to put the uh, sustainability framework as we develop those projects. The, uh, the three projects that we've got, um, high purity alumina, we'll get into a bit more detail about what these markets are. Um, the Jamison Tank Manganese Sulfate Project and the, the Kimber, Kalen and Rare Earth Projects are all very much focused on selling into the, uh, the lithium battery market supply chain and also into the EV space. The key component of all of those um, markets is really the marketing. So we've already started the, uh, the engagement with global cathode manufacturers, EV manufacturers um, to get our product out there. And as we heard with the, the previous presentation, um, high purity for anything in a battery space is really key. So we need to know what the specs are that the, the buyers are looking for. High purity alumina uh, is a, a, a well-established and very fast growing market. It has two main uses. One is uh, as a coating on the separator between the anode and the cathode in the lithium battery. And you can see the graphic there, the toilet, uh, the toilet paper roll looking um, graphic is a, a HPA coated, or you may have heard the term ceramic separator, which sits between the anode and the cathode provides operational uh, benefits to the, uh, to the battery in terms of cyclability and also safety in that it um, helps manage the thermal um, management of the battery. The other key market is synthetic sapphire. Synthetic sapphire uh, is used in a number of high-tech um, uh, uses. The, uh, the key ones, um, LED lights, semiconductors, um, micro LEDs, but it's also uh, got some exceptional um, optical quality. So for those of you that have an iPhone, uh, the camera lens in your iPhone is sapphire. If you've got a, a thumbprint reader, that's sapphire as well. The technology that Hypura has, that uh, Chemex has developed, the Hypura HPA technology, is significantly different from uh, the existing production technologies. Um, it's much less uh, energy intensive and therefore it's a, it's a greener process. But the, the key differentiators, it's scalable. So we can start off with a, a relatively small production capacity and grow as, as demand for our product increases. So we don't have a, a, an overhang of production capacity. Uh, we believe it will be lower cost, both operating and, and capital cost. And importantly, it's independent of mine production. So we don't have um, the, the time or the cost of a, a mine project development um, while we're trying to also develop a, a high purity alumina process. Because it's not uh, tied to a mine production, it's, it's modular in nature. So we can put production facilities close to the end, uh, end users. So the strategy would be to supply the Asian region out of a, a, a facility in Perth, but then also put production facilities in Europe and in North America so that we can supply those uh, battery supply chains as a, a domestic 
uh, supplier. Uh, that reduces the carbon footprint of the logistics chain because we're not shipping it halfway around the world and also the risk of supply. Um, the technology we've got is also capable of producing multiple products. So there are a number of grades of high purity alumina. Um, the main grade is what we call four nines or 99.99% pure. And that generally goes into the, the battery separator market. And then the uh, high purity five nines or even six nines going into optical and, and the sapphire market. The, the technology is also able to produce um, aluminium sulfate salts, which is a, a, uh, an input into the, the cathode of, of lithium, of some of the, the lithium batteries. Um, the, uh, the technology is uh, groundbreaking. Um, and so we've got a, a uh, patent application working through the process at the moment. Just the, the development of the technology, it's been worked on for the last three years. Um, since listing, we've um, developed a, a micro plant to take that technology from the lab into a continuous process. And because it's a novel process, as with, with any, any chemical uh, process, there's risk in scaling up. There's unintended consequences. So we've taken the, the decision to have two stages of, um, of plant with the micro plant, and the next stage will be a pilot plant, which will be about 50 tonnes capacity per annum, um, which we're in, in the process of uh, starting the, the design work at the moment. Um, and then moving on to the commercial plant once we've got the um, pilot plant established. So the, the key parameters or the key milestones we're looking for, we need to prove that the process can produce a four nines grade product. And we've got some material in with the, the laboratory at the moment. Then we um, work on the five nines product. We get the detailed design work done for the micro, sorry, for the pilot plant. And then we start construction. So the next, six or eight months is going to be very busy for the um, for the high purity um, technology. For the Jamison tank manganese project, so the Chemex owns 100% of two um, exploration tenements um, on the Air Peninsula in South Australia. Um, the uh, Jamison tank uh, manganese project has had a fair bit of exploration done for it um, by the likes of uh, Western Mining and, and BHP, but they were looking for a, a direct ship grade manganese project. Now we don't have the the, the scales to compete on a direct ship manganese project, but it is a perfect size for a manganese sulfate project. And importantly, for any project development, uh, the Air Peninsula is uh, is very well serviced in terms of infrastructure. So we've got renewable energy, wind farms, power farms, um, uh, solar farms, um, roads, rail, we've got port facilities. We're about 120 kilometres southwest of Wyala, which is a well-established um, mining and, and steel town. So we've got the services and we've got the people. So everything you need for a successful project development, we've got on our doorstep. And why manganese? Um, manganese is a key component in the battery cathode chemistry. Um, you can see um, on the, the graphic on the right there, that's a list of some of the, the various battery chemistries that are actually in production at the moment. Everywhere you see M, that's manganese. Um, so it's involved in a number of, of different battery chemistries and provides um, a range of benefits for particular purposes. So each one of those battery chemistries is designed for a particular purpose. Um, why are we so bullish on, on the use of manganese? There's been a number of, of car manufacturers and battery manufacturers, including um, Volkswagen and Tesla, who have come out over the last couple of years and said, that they're looking to increase the percentage of manganese in their batteries. Um, the main driver for that is security of supply. So uh, with nickel and cobalt uh, production capacity limited, um, and certainly nickel sulfide is very hard to find outside of, of Western Australia, um, they're looking to move towards a material that is, is available. Manganese itself is a 20 plus 
ton, uh, 20 million ton a year market, um, which um, is most, most of that goes into the, the steel industry. Only a small percentage goes into, into the chemical uh, space and, and into batteries. So the real uh, bottleneck for the industry is not so much the availability of manganese, but it's the production capacity for manganese sulfate. So that's where uh, Chemex is uh, working hard to help overcome that bottleneck. We've undertaken one stage of, of metallurgical test work, our initial program back in May this year. Um, it came out with very encouraging results and we're um, undergoing the second stage at the moment. Now, the, the purpose of, of the current program is to come out with a, a battery grade or cathode grade manganese sulfate material, which will allow us to start um, negotiations with, with potential off takers. The outcome of, the, of this test work will also enable us to develop the, the flow sheet and then that will lead into an engineering study. And we've got a, uh, another exploration program planned for the first quarter next year. Uh, the Kimber Kale and Rare Earth Project. Uh, it's located on the same tenement as the Jamison Tank Magazine, Ma Manganese Project, just further to the north. So we've got the same infrastructure for any project development um, that we, we undertake. Kale mineralization has been known in this area for the last 50 years. We undertook a, a drill program earlier this year um, and discovered that we had rare earth associated with the kale. So that came out of left field. We weren't, weren't expecting that um, and has really uh, changed how we view the project. So we've got material in with ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation, uh, to work out the best way of, of separating the rare earths from the kaolin, and that will really um, guide us on how we develop this project. Uh, kaolin itself it has a number of, of, um, of uses. Uh, it's a 30 million tonne per annum market. It's used in um, things like ceramics, uh, paper coating, rubber, fiberglass. Um, there are a number of traditional markets. One area that we're doing some work on is the use of kaolin uh, in the Portland cement manufacturing process to reduce the carbon uh, footprint of that process. So cement manufacturer globally is the seventh largest emitter, emitting industry of CO2. So we're looking at how we might use kaolin to replace part of the limestone in that process um, to, uh, to reduce the uh, uh, carbon footprint. So the development over that one, we've got to wait on the results from ANSTO. Um, and again, we've got an, a follow-on drill program planned for the first quarter next year. So over the next 12 months, with uh, three active projects going on, we've got a lot of news flow. We've got a lot of key milestones coming up um, in, the, in the path to development of each one of those projects. As with any company, is really the it's the people that make it. Uh, our board um, has a range of experience from uh, project development to operations uh, to uh, corporate governance and, and corporate activity. And similarly, with our management team, very experienced in the markets that we're operating in. Um, they've all gone through project developments, um, a strong history in battery and the battery supply chain. So we're well, well qualified to deliver on the projects that we're looking at. So in short, uh, Chemex, we've got the right people, we've got the right projects and we're selling into the right markets to, de to deliver sustainable long-term shareholder value as we develop our projects. Um, I think I'm running short on time. So if you've got any questions, um, I look forward to seeing you in the booth. Thank you. Thank you, David. All our, all our technology is against us at the moment. Thank you, David. Uh, 
Right, we're going to move on. We've got three more presentations to listen to and get some insight into before we break for morning tea. Uh, now, West Australian focused mineral exploration company Minimar Resources is next up. They've outlined a potential camp scale gold discovery at their Gidji uh, joint venture project. There's a recent visible gold from diamond holes at its Glandor project and is it true there might be diamonds lurking in there somewhere? This person is going to have all the answers to these questions. Would you please welcome Miramar's technical director? She's a geo with 25 years of experience under her belt. Would you please welcome Marion Bush? Thanks very much, Chrissy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thanks, Vertical Events, for the opportunity to present Miramar Resources this morning. Uh, I'm, I only have a limited amount of time to speak this morning, so please do download our presentation uh, and you can enjoy things like our disclaimer at your leisure. But there's also some projects I won't be able to speak very much about today, so there'll be some bonus slides at the back that you can have a look at. So Miramar Resources, reasons to invest in us. We are just over two years old, having listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in October 2020. We are a junior exploration company with a diverse portfolio of exploration assets based here in Western Australia. Our, uh, our assets cover a variety of different commodities and are at various stages of exploration from concept and application through to bedrock testing. If I go through, oh, I can't really see here. Um, so if I just give you a snapshot of, I'm only going to be able to present on three of the projects, but down, I don't want to, oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. So down in the Eastern Goldfields, I'm going to talk about Glandall, where we currently have a diamond rig, um, following up on some historic significant gold intercepts in Diamond Core. Gigi, where we've spent majority of our time and we think we're uncovering a potential new gold camp. Up here to Onslow, just outside, sorry, Whaleshark, just outside of Onslow, where we have some large IOCG, so iron oxide copper gold targets. What I can't present today on is our Bangamore projects. It's a la large land holding perspective for nickel, copper, and platinum group elements. Down here, Langwell, which is perspective for gold, and we have some pegmatites, which potentially could hold rare earths. And then back down here, our third project, at in the Eastern Goldfields Randalls, which is prospective for gold and has a Silver Lake Hall Road running through the middle of it. Um, our board have a track record of discovery and production. Uh, our executive chairman, Alan Kelly, was one of the founding directors of Dore that found and went into production with the Andy Well Mine. Uh, and we are active explorers with regular news flow. We're very proud of the statistic that 75% of what we've spent to date has gone directly into exploration. So if it's there, we feel we're giving ourselves the best opportunity to find it. I won't spend too much time on this. The main thing really to point out to you is just our EV. It's very low. It's very low, especially considering the amount of projects we have and the potential those projects have. So focusing on uh, in the Eastern Goldfields, we have three projects. They're all strategically placed close to infrastructure and close to existing gold operations, which means there's a variety of different uh, avenues for development for these projects. Mm -hmm. The Gigi project, oh, wasn't meant to do that. The Gigi project, where we've spent majority of our time, is a 15, it, it's got a 15 kilometer strike length across the Barara shear zone, which is a major regional structure uh, it's got some fantastic neighbours, Paddington to the north, um, Barara to the south, Canana Bell to the east, and of course Mount Charlotte and the Super Pit just down here to the southwest. This is only 15 kilometres outside of Kalgoorlie, and we were really surprised and really lucky to be able to get this one. Glandor that I'm going to speak about next, it's, uh, it's been historically explored by Anglo Gold Ashanti and Harmony, and they intersected in Diamond Core some significant gold intercepts and we're following up on those at the moment. It's covered by a salt lake. And then down here at Randalls, which is um, has potential for gold in a folded biff. Oh, going backwards, I'm really not very good at this. So looking at Glandor, Glandor is just 40 kilometers outside of Kalgoorlie. It's based largely on a salt lake and as a result has been largely underexplored. It, 
is very similar, we think, geologically to um, Majestic and Trojan. So it's associated with these late time granitoid and um, granitoid intrusions that we have up here. Uh, it's very close to existing uh, or planned processing facilities down here by um, Black Cat. So having a bit of a closer look at um, Glandor and not to go too geological on you, but it's a layered mafic sequence intruded by a granitoid. That's the big pink thing in the middle. And uh, originally it was explored and they were looking at more of a Granny Smith model. So looking at gold around the outside of the granite. Um, we in September last year did a broad spaced air core program filling in some of the gaps where they hadn't drilled before. And we've outlined a five kilometer long uh, air core anomaly of um, anomalous gold. And it's also given us a different framework for what we're looking for. So rather than around the outside of the granitoid, we think that the gold is actually intersecting much like majestic and Trojan and Imperial. It's actually inside the granitoid in these Northeast trending structures. Uh, we recently did a drone magnetic survey there, which has really helped to inform some of those structures. And we currently have a diamond rig just here at Glandor East where the historic intercepts are. Um, and and that, that magnetic survey has really helped to inform our um, positioning of those holes. And here we've drilled three holes so far. This is, um, we've had assays back from the first hole. This is the second hole where you can see um, visible gold and the, uh, the assays are still outstanding. If we focus just on um, Glandor East where we're drilling, it was originally a 1.2 kilometre long uh, air core anomaly. Diamond drilling to date has been sporadic. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is we, with our new model, we're trying to um, create continuity between the drilling and to also flesh it out a bit more. So in this section here, you can see gold occurs in super gene layer at the top, but it's all dipping. It's also dipping off to the West here. It's open at depth. Um, and it's also open at strike with a lot of strike potential. So we have three holes we've drilled so far. Two have the first two had visible gold. The first one we um, have released the we have the results for, and we had just under a meter at just under fourteen grams a ton. We've seen visible gold in the second hole, and we're waiting for the results for that. And the third hole looks really interesting too, and we're waiting for the results for that. And the, we've still got the drill rig there doing um, a few more holes. Uh, this project has real potential to be developed quite quickly. Looking at the Gigi JV project, if you've been to Kalgoorlie and you've been to the Broad Arrow pub, you've driven straight through the center of our project. It has the uh, Goldfields Highway running through the center of it. As I said before, we've got some great neighbors, Paddington and the super pit down here. Um, it's just 15 kilometers outside of Cal. And we were really surprised when we picked this up, just how little exploration had really been done. Uh, it also, as, as normal, course of work we do multi-element geochemistry with all the air core drilling we've done here and that's mainly to inform our geology but it's also told us that we have nickel potential here um, having a closer look at Gigi uh, as I said before it's got a large section of the Barara shear zone through it which is a major regional structure it's really very very exciting we think we are uncovering a potential new gold camp here so what I mean by that is gold in multiple structural settings in multiple lithologies, um, which is pretty exciting. And just down to the south here, we, there is a deposit. So Northern Star, I should probably tell you this, abut us just to the south, and they have a 300,000 ounce gold deposit there, which they've just started drilling again. So there's something happening at depth there, and we think it's continuing onto our ground. So if I have a look at, um, and we're working through this, it's a large package. We're working through it with RC. We've done some diamond too, but we really haven't done a lot of um, bedrock testing. So if I zone in on this area where we've done a lot of work in just here, and then I'll talk briefly about this. Um, so in this area, um, I just want to give you a sense of the size of these air core anomalies. So Marlebone, where we've had some cracking grades, uh, it's like a two pronged sort of thing. It, it's got a 1.6 kilometre strike length, and we've had grades up to 13 grams a tonne. Down here at Blackfriars, it's 1.4 kilometre long strike length, and we've had grades of up to nearly 12 grams a tonne. 
And then down here at Blackfriars and Highway, we've had multiple uh, two gram a tonne hits. Looking at Barara North, we, we had this granted in uh, like the last year. So we've just conducted our first air core program here on the shear zone, and we're waiting for the assays back from that. Uh, and we also have identified two other targets, Lake and Claypan. Lake is um, some historic significant gold RC intersections. And just to the south here are some old gold workings and open pit. Moving on to whale shark. Whale shark is based just 40 kilometers outside of Onslow. Fantastic location if you like fishing. Um, it's in the Ashburton. It's a Proterozoic biff underneath, intruded by a granitoid, underneath the sediments of the Carnarvon Basin. And the sediments deepen out towards the coast here, but we're under around 150 metres of sediments here. Um, it's a really good location. There's a lot going on in Onslow now. Uh, there's a port just here. Hastings are in the area. And we also have Minrares are building a great big haul road right past our front door, caused us a few problems at our recent um, drilling program here. So last year we conducted two um, soil sampling surveys here called mobile metal iron surveys. So they are designed to, um, or that they, it's really low detection survey. And because we're surveying the transported cover, it's similar to what they used at Havoyera in the discovery of Havoyera. And we um, outlined two anomalies, two coincident copper rare earth anomalies. And we've just completed our first drill program there, drilling through the, um, the Carnarvon basement sediments down to just hit the um, basement. And air core assays are outstanding on that. Oh, wrong button again. Um, this is a slide just to pictorially show you that we have a variety of different projects at a variety of different stages. Um, and I've spoken about Glandor, Gigi and Whale Shark. Oh, I'm really bad at this. Um, but what I haven't had time to tell you about is our Bangamore projects. But again, if you download the pack, you can get some information at the back. Um, these are prospective for nickel, copper and platinum group elements. We're really pretty excited about those. Um, one of the targets there, Blue Bar, this one, we've just recently found has um, some, in some historic reports, has a very significant find of micro diamonds there. Um, I haven't talked about Randalls, where we also recently, just outside of Kalgoorlie, where we recently completed a drill program. We're looking for gold in the fold hinges of a biff there. Um, that has a Silver Lake Hall Road or Silver Lakes Hall Road running through the middle of it. Um, so very good potential if we found something there that someone might be interested in it as well. Uh, and we've just completed a air core program there and the assays are pending. And then Langwell, which is an eight kilometre long uh, gold, historic gold anomaly um, that we haven't been out again on the ground there yet. And we've also recently discovered it has um, a lot of pegmatites on it that could have potential for rare earths. So just in summary, um, we're serious explorers. We like to put as much of our money as possible into the ground. We really think we've got some fantastic opportunities here with more than one project. Um, we currently have assays outstanding on our Gigi North Air Corps program, our whale shark program, which could be a game changer at our ISCG project, our uh, uh, Randalls, our first pass drilling there across the fold hinges of the BIF, and also ongoing drilling at Glandor where we're seeing visible gold. We have a track record of discovery and development, and we've got regular news flow. So thank you very much for your time. I've finished with 40 seconds to go. Um, and if you have any questions, please come and see us at the booth or please drop us a note through our website anytime. That would be great. Thank you. Well done, Marianne Bush. That was a very good, great presentation as well. Now, Lithium Energy. Uh, Lithium Energy was one of the most successful IPOs in 2021. This fellow is Pete Smith. He's the executive director of Lithium Energy, and he's here today to tell us why they believe that Lithium Energy stands out from the rest of the battery minerals companies that have presented to you this week and why you should jump on board with them. Please make him welcome. There we go. Um, 
thank you for you know being allowed to present here and to you know, greet everybody. Um, looking into the audience, there's a bit of the morning after the night before, and I would like to thank Can Accord uh, for for a lovely evening last night. Um, we're here to um, present fairly quickly. We'd like to let everybody know what we're up to. Um, we're uniquely positioned um, for the energy transition. Um, we've got a fairly major lithium project over in Argentina, and we have graphite in Queensland, Australia. Um, we listed in May last year at 20 cents. And um, if you have a look at the, the way that we're moving forward, it's a, a fairly steady progression. Um, and we're currently trading uh, in and around the, the high um, 115 to 120 sort of range. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, two principal project commodities, lithium and graphite. Um, they're obviously you know, a very important ingredients in the, the lithium ion batteries. Um, and I'll give a, a little bit of a summary of, of where we're at, starting off with the lithium. Um, we're currently uh, drilling our first hole um, in the project. It's uh, going extremely well. We've uh, announced, um, I think yesterday, that we'd actually um, have hit, gone through the upper aquifer of, of two aquifers that we're targeting. Um, and there's 173 metre intersection there. Um, so we're, we're quite excited about that. Um, the project's actually located probably in one of the best addresses in the world for, for brine um, lithium. It's you know, in the lithium triangle. Um, we have extremely good neighbors. Um, in the likes of uh, Lithium Americas and uh, Allchem. Um, we're snuggled up against the, the boundary um, of the, the Allchem leases, and we're only 15 kilometres from their production facilities. So, yeah, the address is right. Um, we're, we're drilling our first drill hole. We're hitting the, the aquifers that we were hoping for, and we're just starting to get some assays back, which are highly encouraging from the top of the, the first aquifer. So the, as you can see here, I'm too sure if we've got um, the first part of the hole. One of the problems that we have in, in, in this project is that um, there's a, a fresh water and a brine. So the fresh water, um, we have an obligation to keep separated such that brines don't get mixed up with the fresh water. Um, so we, we actually cement when we're drilling the top part all the way down through there. And then we, we start um, diamond coring from, from beneath the, that transition all the way down. So, you know, how do we know where that, that intersection is? You know, we've done a lot of uh, geophysics prior to drilling our first hole. And um, at this stage, the transition zone we're able to pick up extremely well. So, you know, we can transition through um, cement off and, uh, and then, uh, start drilling the, uh, the the lithologies that we're after, which in this case are, are predominantly sandstones, and sandstones are highly porous, and um, and, and they're, they're the sort of things that make production fairly easy um, because you don't have to have as many boreholes down to actually extract the volumes of fluid that you need to extract down. So the We'll just go down through here. Um, the sandstones pretty much start from there. We go all the way down through here until we come to a seal. That, that distance there is a is 173 meters. So it's predominantly sandstone, and we call it our upper aquifer. Our, uh, there's a seal, a mudstone seal, which is in through here, and that essentially separates the the top aquifer from our main target, which is down here, which is uh, another porous sandstone. Um, and then we were expecting basement um, round about this, this depth down here, round about the, the 380 to 400 metres. Um, but if we keep coming across sandstones, then we'll keep drilling until we come into basement. So, but it's going to be in that sort of order based on the, um, the work that we've done with the geophysics. The, um, the assays that we've had so far have, that have come back are really from this top portion up through here. Um, 
we had some leakage round about the top with some of the fresh water, which we've we've now cemented off. Um, and the assays are, are in this part through here, and they're about you know 400 um, ppm, which is uh, is a good start considering that's at the top of the sequence. As we get the, the results back from further down through here and down through here, we expect that they will probably increase. So the, the first hole that we're currently drilling is, is really part of a, a 10 hole program. It's probably a minimum of 10 holes. If we get enough uh, joy and uh, excitement, then we'll probably increase the number of holes that we're drilling. Um, and these holes will, the first one is, is located um, just here. And then the, the others will be you know, more up in, in this sort of area up in through here. And the idea is as a first pass to get an idea of the overall size of what we're looking at. And I think get an eye overall size, you look down here at the scale. So we're looking at a very large area, anything up to about 25 kilometers from one end of the project area to the other. Um, the draw holes will pre be nominally about five kilometers apart. So again, very, very broad spacing. Um, we're trying to find out what the overall scope of the project is in the initial first pass. The exploration target that we have is um, between 1.5 to 8.7 million tonnes of lithium carbonate. And we've got some grade ranges there, which are grade ranges which have been developed from the other exploration companies and mining companies that are within the, the same sailor. So our grades will end up being of similar sort of level. Exactly what level it is, we don't know yet. We're still drawing. Our principal, principal target is this this zone down here which is our deep sand unit and then we've got the upper target which is initially thought to be mostly muds with you know, interbedded sandstones and the location where we're drilling there's an awful lot of sandstone there so that actually bodes well for the you know the the size of the the, the aquifer it's a little bit uh, thicker than what we are originally interpreting as well so that's that's a bit of a bonus as well This is where we're at in the, the current draw hole. Um, we're near the, the edge of the sailor. There's a, a boundary bolt that comes up through here. Um, and we're, we're down at, at this level now. Um, so we're getting close to the bottom and we're still in, in, the, in, in the right sort of rock. So that, that's quite promising. Um, we're then going to head up to, to this neck of the woods over here. And here the, the brines are interpreted to be quite a bit deeper, but also quite a bit thicker. So, you know, the, um, the big targets are up in this neck of the woods. So um, we're looking forward to uh, getting onto drilling those where we're trying to scout down some extra drill rigs so we can actually speed up the process and have a, a number of drill holes on the go at once because they seem to be taking a little bit longer than we anticipated. And that's predominantly due to the drilling conditions which um, you know, we're having a lot more sandstones than what we originally were expecting, which is, is a good problem to have. The next steps um, is to try and fast track. We're obviously trying to, to get another drill rig um, for the 15 or the 5,000 metre drill program. Uh, and the aim is to come up with a, a maiden uh, jork resource. Um, the, the geophysics has, has pretty much been uh, completed. We've uh, got a model and we're working on putting that uh, together and, and, and updating it with the, the draw results as we go. So these are some of the people on the team. That's uh, William, he's currently over there and uh, some other people of the team. Um, so that's Paola and that, that's Esteban. So um, we also give uh, conferences in country and uh, this is the uh, the draw rig um, in the afternoon. So um, we keep a fairly clean site and um, we, we like to make sure that uh, uh, as best we can, we're operating to, um, to Australian sort of sta safety standards. Uh, the other project that we have is, is a graphite project. Um, it already has a, an inferred resource on it. It's, um, it's a highly... Um, 
high grade, I guess, uh, graphite deposit. Um, it has a, a, a jork resource of uh, 6.3 million tons at 16% total um, graphite. Um, it's, it's got a higher grade portion and we're looking at doing some more drilling uh, before Christmas, um, which we'll be able to uh, focus more on, on that higher grade zone, which is over 20%. Um, so as you, can, as you can see from the section here, it's um, relatively well behaved, it's near surface and it's wide. So, and the grades are quite strong. It's got a combination of um, flake sizes from fine to, to large and to extra large. Uh, and we've been working through the, the various processing options. Um, and at this stage, the, the work that we're looking at is, is putting it fairly square in the middle of the, um, the battery market. So, you know, the, the best processing options is looking like the, the graphite market, and we've had CSIRO uh, doing a lot of work for us over the last year and a half. So there'll be um, some more news coming on that in due course um, as we try and get a drill rig on the ground before Christmas. As I mentioned, you know, there's been a fair bit of work done with this. Um, and we're looking at the possibility of having a PSG. PSG is purified spherical graphite. Um, it's essentially the, the format that the battery manufacturers like to actually have their batteries in uh, or the graphite for their batteries in. And then they put their special coatings. It's sort of like the KFC, you know, special spices. They all have different combinations uh, of, um, of technology, which they don't tell anybody about. But in essence, they, they coat over the PSG products and we're, we're looking at the option of having a, a PSG plant um, relatively local to the project, whether that is in Townsville, whether that's in Mount Isa or Cloncurry. Um, we're going to do some studies and we'll find out from those studies where the, where the best place is. The, the, the other project that we have there, which we have yet to drill, is um, is the the Corella uh, graphite project? Um, these are some results from a, a, an EM survey that we did. Yeah, you know, and essentially, the more conductive the material is essentially where the graphite is. So the graphite is quite conductive, and it's a very good proxy. Um, so the, the near surface, we're getting quite a scattering of uh, of graphite content, but. The, the real location where the thickness is of the graphite is actually where these, these colorful zones are. So essentially the red blobs and uh, we'll be going in there and, and drilling those um, hopefully um, in the near future. Um, excellent. <laughs> so the, the, the board that we have is uh, is, is quite a, a varied board. We've got the chairman, which is uh, William. He's uh, very much a, a hands-on guy. As I said, he's currently over in Argentina. We have uh, Farouk Khan, who's is presently here today with a legal background. I've got myself, um, exploration background. We have a company secretary and, uh, and Victor. And to assist us over in, in Argentina, specifically with the, the Bryans, we have uh, a technical consultant called Murray Brooker. And Murray's highly experienced uh, hydrologist with 31 years in the industry. And he's, he's compiled a number of, of uh, jaw compliant, compliant and Canadian compliant um, resources specifically on, um, on brines. So we're, we're very happy to have him working with us and uh, his, um, his, his knowledge is, is very much appreciated as we go forward. In summary, lithium is well positioned to take advantage of the forecast global growth and demand for key battery minerals in lithium and graphite. Um, we believe that we have a fairly strong technical team and we'll be expanding on that in the near future. So uh, if you have any questions, I know I'm just about to be shooed off. So um, come and see us at the booth. And, um, and we've got some gifts there, including some llama gifts. There's some little llamas. So um, if people want to find out what that is, that's, that's good. Come along to the booth. In addition, we've got the uh, prize that we're giving away. So we'll probably do a draw on that in the last, last end of the session.
Okay. He's bribing us. I'm open to a bit of bribery at the end of the uh, session. That's fine. Right, we have one more to go before we break for morning tea. This fellow up here, full of energy, ready to go. Got a lot to get through, haven't you? I should be quiet and sit down. I'm going to go through. This is Roger Mason, everyone. He is the Managing Director of Antipode Minerals. Now, Roger has been the Managing Director since 2011. So he's got his 10-year long service. He's pushing forward further ahead. He's made a heck of a lot of discoveries in that time. If I go through, he's got uh, the Patterson province. That was 2.1 million ounce, a calibre gold copper deposit, defining total combined resources approximately 4.3 million ounces of gold, 226,000 tonnes of copper. There's the 1.8 million ounce, do I say Minyari Dome? Minyari, that's Min, the... Minyari Dome gold copper deposits. And they're currently the subject of a pre-feasibility -feas study. So he's got a lot to talk about and a lot to interest in you in. Please make him welcome everyone. Thanks, uh, Canaccord. Thanks for the introduction and, and thanks everyone for your time. Uh, this is our standard disclaimer. Antipa's uh, combined exploration and, and project development portfolio covers a massive 5,100 square kilometres, and it's located 400 kilometres east of Port Hedland in Western Australia. Put that in perspective, our ground holding is roughly the size of barley. Our belt scale portfolio consists of four complementary large-scale growth projects, including our flagship 100% owned Minyari Dome project, which in combination with our 35% owned Citadel Rio Tinto joint venture project, hosts the majority of our 3.8 million ounce gold equivalent attributable resource and two significant advanced development evaluation assets. We also have two farming projects covering more of this tier one geology, which provide advanced exploration optionality, fully funded by our major partners, Newcrest and IGO. And deepest market cap is around $93 million, and we are very well cashed up, having recently raised just over $12 million. Note the strong strategic 27% cornerstone to our register, which includes our major shareholder Newcrest with 10%, institutions with 10%, IGO with 3.4% and the board with around 4%. The Antipa board has 190 years experience, uh, which includes many greenfield discoveries, project evaluations, mine developments and productions, for multiple commodities in multiple jurisdictions. Our board has a, a proven track record of value creation for shareholders. The recently announced scoping study for Antipa's 100% owned Minyari Dome project highlights the potential for a significant standalone gold development opportunity. And this has fundamentally repositioned Antipa by highlighting a potential pathway to transition from exploration to becoming a producer. The project boasts a resource of 1.8 million ounces of gold and a mining inventory of 1.1 million ounces. This development opportunity is strategically located in WA's tier one gold copper Patterson province, close to Newcrest's Telfer processing facility. A drill program with the objective of delivering further uh, significant resource growth to boost the project economics commenced in June and the pre-feasibility study commenced recently. The scoping study delivered an initial combined open pit and underground mining inventory of 21.4 million tonnes at 1.6 grams per tonne for 1.1 million ounces of gold generating a pre-tax NPV of $392 million at an internal rate of return of 34%. The project's initial processing life of seven plus years at a throughput of 3 million tonnes per annum uh, delivers almost 1 million ounces. Uh, we have an impressive 168,000 ounces per annum for the first five years of the project life. 
the all in sustaining cost is just 1,475 Australian dollars per ounce of gold. And the pre-production capital cost is $275 million, uh, which has a payback period of two and a half years. The study used a gold price of 2,430 Australian dollars per ounce. And it's worth noting that the current spot price uh, of gold adds $160 million to the project's free cash flow. Critically, this is just the beginning for our Minyari Dome project, uh, with the project economics hugely leveraged to future resource growth. And that will come from both brownfield extensional targets and greenfield opportunities. So we are drilling to unlock this full value potential. Strategically, the project is located just 35 kilometres from Newcrest Telfer 22 million tonne per annum processing facility, which by 2024 will have huge spare capacity. However, a standalone Minyari Dome development is our preferred case. There are three key levers with the potential to boost the project's value. Firstly, clear and substantial upside to the project's life by a further down plunge resource extensional targets at both Minyari and Waka. Growth and incorporation uh, of nearby satellite resources. Drill out of recent discoveries and new major discoveries across the project. Secondly, further exploration success delivers the potential to push back the final years of low grade ore uh, stockpile processing and materially boost the project economics. And thirdly, additional project optimization, including potential copper and cobalt byproduct output. Uh, that'll be investigated via further metallurgical test work targeting improved byproduct recoveries and concentrate grades. The project offers significant resource growth opportunities, and so we kicked off a drilling. Uh, program in June and currently have two rigs on site. Our objective is to materially increase the open pit and underground resource and extend the project life by two or more years. This Minyari deposit long section shows the distribution of the resource, which is hosted by 50 to 200 metre thick breccia bodies, which start at the surface and remain open down plunge below a depth of 670 metres. Also note where relative to the Minyari deposit, the top of the 5.5 million ounce Haverin deposit is located, which is 430 metres um, below barren cover. Minyari is analogous to Haverin, and these intrusion related deposits deliver serious endowment comparable to De Grey's Hemi deposits. Uh, with Haverin delivering 5,500 ounces per vertical metre and Minyari 3,300 ounces per vertical metre. Keep in mind that for typical gold deposits, 1,000 ounces per vertical metre would be considered high endowment. Intensity and grade of these intrusion uh, related breccia style ore bodies can increase rapidly. And so drill testing of the high priority Minyari uh, plunge target and also the Minyari North target are currently in progress. In addition, the project offers significant resource growth opportunities from advanced uh, prospects and high priority exploration targets, including four soil geochemical anomalies, all within proximity to Minyari. Last year, we made multiple greenfield discoveries, several of which delivered maiden resources which we aim to increase by the middle of next year. Several other discoveries, including Minyari North, have maiden resource potential, which we aim to deliver by the ongoing drilling. These multiple discoveries highlight the shallow resource upside uh, for the project and also the mineral camp style setting. The scoping study's positive findings uh, led to the commencement of a pre-feasibility study uh, with the objective of propelling Antipa further toward a development decision on a standalone mining and processing operation by late next year. The growth drill program with the objective to further increase the resource and boost the project economics will deliver an updated resource estimate around the middle of next year 
for incorporation into the PFS mine schedule. There is so much more to the Antipa story with three additional complementary growth projects, which are huge in every sense of the word. Huge belt scale combined exploration area totaling almost 5,000 square kilometres. Huge partners, Rio Tinto, Newcrest and IGO. Huge partner combined funding requirements of up to $115 million. And huge tier one gold copper discovery potential. Antipa currently owns 35% of the 1,200 square kilometre Citadel joint venture project with Rio Tinto, exposing shareholders to a significant slice of serious upside, including the potential development of the 2.1 million ounce calibre gold copper deposit and exciting greenfield discovery potential, uh, all less than 40 kilometres from Rio Tinto's tier one Winu gold, oh sorry, copper gold development project. Citadel hosts uh, resources of 2.4 million ounces of gold and 162,000 tonnes of copper, of which Antipa's slice is currently 1.2 million gold equivalent ounces. Rio Tinto are fully funding the 2022 exploration program, uh, which is focused on greenfield copper gold discoveries and the ongoing evaluation of a potential development opportunity at Calibre. The objective being to identify future feed for Winu's uh, proposed Winu plant. Our third project is the 1500 square kilometre Patterson farming project with IGO. And I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of Antipa to once again offer our sincere condolences to Peter Bradford's family, friends, and colleagues. The project comes to within a few kilometers of Winu and surrounds our Minyari Dome project. And IGO needs to spend $30 million to earn a 70% interest, and in addition, must free carry Antipa to the completion of a feasibility study. Currently, Antipa still owns 100% of this project. The Patterson project has a greenfield discovery focus for nifty and winu analogues, the objective being high grade copper uh, discoveries to satisfy IGO's future facing strategy. This year, the project's multifaceted exploration program has been identifying additional greenfield copper gold targets, including two exciting coincident gravity magnetic targets with drill testing uh, commencing uh, soon. In addition, next, early next year, to have your own analogue targets, just a long strike from Winu will be drill tested. Our 2,200 square kilometre Wilkie farming project with Newcrest comes within a few kilometres of both Telfer and Haviron. Newcrest need to spend $60 million to earn a 75% interest. Currently, Antipa still owns 100% of this project. The Wilkie project has a greenfield discovery focus for gold rich Haviron and Telfer analogues. The objective being to discover new ore sources within 50 kilometers of Telfer's 22 million tonne per annum plant, which is rapidly running out of ore. All this culminates in a huge amount of discovery focused exploration across our belt scale combined portfolio in a province which over the last seven years has delivered greenfield discoveries totaling 16 million ounces of gold and 3 million tonnes of copper. In wrapping up, Antipa is emerging as a potential tier one gold copper business with several investment catalysts. Minyari Dome Project's significant standalone development opportunity fundamentally repositions Antipa by highlighting a potential pathway to production. A pre-feasibility study for the project is being run in parallel with a resource growth drill program aimed at extending the project life and significantly boosting the project economics. And with a total spend across our four projects this year of approximately $15 million, another Patterson Province Tier 1 discovery could just be around the corner. Look, thanks everybody for your time. We do have a, a stand uh, or table outside there if people would like to come and uh, ask questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Roger Mason. We're going to go and have a half an hour break. And when you come back, we've got gold, 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 and more gold investments and the company behind a life-changing dental and knee implant technology. So that'll be interesting. Half